humans, you have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hey everybody, <laughs> the devil went down to the Command Zone podcast, which you're listening to right now. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Quiet. You know that opening just gets more embarrassing every week. Digga 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 digga. I'm just saying digga 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 it's yeah, a classic. I'm Josh Lee Kwai. How's it? <laughs> we have a action-packed episode today with a lot to get into, so we're just going to dive right in. Uh, today we are breaking down Josh Lee Kwai's amazing deck from the last Game Nights episode. Surprise! It's a Game Nights episode that you guys have been wa- uh, waiting for with Prof and Wedge. And Homebrew Commander decks. All uh, right. If you have not watched it yet, I s- highly suggest that you go do before watching the rest of this episode because we're probably going to give away a few things. We'll try not to yeah. spoil everything, but you know how that goes. Um, we also have some previews from Battle Bond. Ooh, yes. And we have, um, well, we're going to be cracking some really old packs from Magic's past. But before we get into all that, we did want to call out some sponsors. This episode is actually sponsored by VRV. Now, we did a call out to VRV uh, a couple of months ago. They are an online streaming service. Mm-hmm. And actually, they, they're giving away a 30-day free trial right now to anyone that wants to sign up. It's essentially a bunch of different platforms all combined together. So, for instance, Crunchyroll is on there as well as Funimation. So, a lot of anime. In fact, one of the things they feature is an offline download mode. So This I was, is my favorite thing. I yeah. was on the airplane to China and I was watching My Hero Academia episodes that were still not out. And I was watching them on my phone. That was great. That was great. I had a blast. That's actually the show that I want to watch. That's the one I've sort of heard the most it's about, so but I've good. never watched yet. It's so. the best anime. So go to vrv.co slash command zone. And if you use that affiliate link when you sign up, you'll really be helping support our show and also trying out a really cool service. Yeah. Yeah. VRV is great. They have a lot of awesome stuff like, what do we got? Food Wars. Yeah. Dragon Ball Super, Black Clover. Being Puppy Cat, Bravest Warriors. So cartoons and animation from across the room as well as live action stuff but to find out what they have go to vrv.co slash command zone sign up support the show and get a free 30-day trial and trust me i had Crunchyroll and all of our services before this now i've consolidated them all into one and it's extremely extremely useful for me so you know what else is extremely useful oh. to protect your cards <laughs> when you're either playing them shuffling them whatever is ultra pro products they create uh the awesome eclipse sleeves they have great play mats they have awesome dice and deck boxes. Ultra Pro, a great sponsor of this show. And by uh, using their products, you're really supporting us as well. Yeah, and Ultra Pro, of course, is working with us on our brand new play mat, which is out right now, but for a limited time only. In fact, the days are running out. I there's believe. probably, at the point you're watching this, there's probably only a matter of hours left in the Kickstarter, maybe yeah. like 36 hours or so. Yeah, literally. And trust me, after you hear about what we're giving away today, you're going to want to sign up and buy one of these play mats. You have to go to Kickstarter. The last damn play mat drawn by Titus Lyncher will never be sold again after this Kickstarter ends. Yeah, this uh, art is beautiful. You really do want to get a hold of this playmat. Again, once that Kickstarter runs out, that's it. Yep. So uh, find the links in the uh, more info box below the video yeah. if you want to purchase that playmat. Okay. All right. A lot of you are here just for this part. So let's talk about our Battle Bond previews. Yeah. Battle Bond is a new set that's coming out, developed uh, and designed by our good friend, Gavin Verhe. Thank you, Gavin, for he's, always supporting the cool stuff. Yeah, he's been uh, tweeting a lot about it, and uh, I would suggest you follow Gavin on Twitter mm-hmm. if you want to sort of get the, I don't know, as much advanced warning as they're ever going to give you about stuff like this. Yeah, the cards are really interesting because some of them have a new mechanic on them, and we'll talk about it right when we spoil slash preview them right yeah. now, I suppose. So we have two preview cards, and they're related, and there's a few... We're told there's a few more pairings in this set that are like this. Now, at the time of this recording, we don't know what those are. They may have been announced by the time you're watching this. We only know ours. Yeah. So um, there's two. The first one is... Well, it's it's fitting, by the way. You're reading one and I'm reading the other color. Yeah, yeah. That's true, actually. The first one is... I got to read the one that I don't even know how to pronounce it. So it's Zundersplut. There are no vowels in Zundersplut's name. So it's Z-N-D-R-S-P-L-T. Eye of Wisdom. It's kind of like Thibble Thip a little bit, right? Yeah. Zinder Split, Eye of Wisdom. Costs four and a blue for a 1-4 legendary creature, Homunculus. And there you go. It has partner with a Kown Eye of Chaos. More on that in a minute. Um, partner with a specific creature is a thing in Battle Bond. So a Kown. A Kown? A Kown? A Kown. 
Okaun. So partner with Okaun. And that means when this creature enters the battlefield, target player may put a cone into their hand from their library, then shovel. So this kind of tutors for a specific card. It partners with that card. We've also been told that these partner with a specific card mm -hmm. can be played as your commander with the other card. So they're kind of like the partner mechanic cool. from commander. What was that? 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they don't partner with anything else with partner. They only partner specifically with each other. Right. So obviously our other preview card is a cone because that wouldn't make any sense so we're going to read that in a second so again zinder split eye of wisdom four and a blue for a one four partner with a coon at it says at the beginning of combat on your turn flip a coin until you lose a flip <laughs> so you flip and you call heads or tails and as soon as you lose one then you stop flipping whenever a player wins a coin flip draw a card whoa whenever a player, player wins a card, a coin flip. I'm sure there are some cards in Magic's history that force other players to flip coins. If someone ultimates Rao Zarek, Woo. you're going to be drawing cards. <laughs> well, and I, maybe we didn't say this. I don't remember if we said it or not. Uh, Battle Bond is designed around two-headed giant. Mm -hmm. So it sort of often refers to other players or your opponents in interesting ways. That also works in Commander because, you know, in one-on-one -on -one Magic all this stuff that says other players really just means your opponent. Right. But in two headed giant, it can mean your other head of your giant and your opponents. And when it says opponents, it doesn't mean your partner. So right. interesting interactions there. So again, Zinder split eye of wisdom, you flip coins uh, at the beginning of combat until you lose a flip. And then whenever a player wins a coin flip, they draw a card. That's any player. So a 50% chance of drawing at least one card every turn before combat. That's pretty good. And then your chances just get less each time, but you could be drawing two, three cards. I mean, they're the same every time. It's 50%. Then yeah. 50%. Well, to win three in yeah. a row, you have to, if 50, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's pretty good. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's an interesting card. It's a five mana one four. Um, <laughs> for commander, I think because it has that partner thing. Well, it uh, automatically draws you a card if you're not playing it as your commander and it's in your deck with the other card. Right. Yeah, that's true. Although, or, no, no, because you can. If you play it as your commander, Oh, you can though, put it from the command zone? They're both in your command zone, right? Oh, right, right. Because they have partner. Um, so but yeah, if it's in your 99, then you draw it. So you tuck the other one when you play it to avoid <laughs> paying can't commander tax. Okay, so I think a lot of this sort of depends on how good Okaun. It's O-K-A-U-N. Okaun. Okaun. Okaun? Okaun. 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 I of chaos. Okaun. Okaun. No, Okaun. I'm going to let you read it. It's the mono red one, so... So this is four in a red as opposed to Xander Split, which is four in a blue. This is a 3-3 three, three legendary creature, Cyclops Berserker. I didn't even know Berserker was a creature, Cyber. <laughs> Partner with Xander Split, Eye of Wisdom. So when this creature enters the battlefield, target player may put Xander Split into their hand from their library, then shuffle. Now, interestingly, I want to point out, it says target player. So if you're two at a giant, I can actually play this card yeah. and then let Jimmy go find his Xander Split from his deck. Yeah, so for instance, if I was playing blue cards and not red, and Josh was playing only red cards, who knows why that would happen. Uh, but we both wanted to play these, but cool. I will play a card that automatically draws Josh a card which is kind of cool tutors it too yeah yeah now here it goes at the beginning of combat on your turn flip a coin until you lose a flip so now everyone's flipping coins and whenever a player wins a coin flip double a coon's power and toughness until end of turn and it's a three three so you win a flip it's a six six then it's a 12 12 yeah uh, and that's whenever any player wins so if you're both sitting there and it's like oh, oh time to trigger trigger so we both flip coins if you're playing Xander's if play, we both win, it's a 12 12 automatically, and the other player draws, draws two a cards. Card, yeah. Draws two, two cards, yeah, because yeah. you both won. And then oh, no, you, you go again. Whenever a player wins a flip, draw a card. So, oh, so you just draw. I just draw Even two if anybody cards, else does. Oh, if yeah. anyone else does too. And then you draw two cards, or you double double. So and then we do it again, and then you, it may I oh, may true, draw two more cards. Won. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it actually synergizes very well with each other because they both will always flip as long as they're on the battlefield. So I love main phase one. Ready? Bam. Bing. Yeah. Play them. Draw it. Play them. Flip coins. Draw some cards. That's cool, and especially if you have any other coin flippy shenanigans, which I can only yeah. assume. Again, these are the only cards we know in Battle Bond be besides uh, that that land cycle, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah. But I can only assume that's kind of going to be a theme. Which means you build a coin flippy deck, and yeah. these these guys are just linchpins in the coin flip deck. Yeah, and there's not many people that play the coin flip deck, but you, you know. know the coin flip deck in ED, in EDH just got way better with these two because yes. you used to had just run like I don't know just a co commander that gave you the right colors. Yeah, that... you didn't have a reason to really do it, but these cards are like please flip coins. This one's always drawing you cards, right? You might have to build the coin flip deck. That'd be a fun one. It's on... like a gambling deck. Yeah, yeah. Everyone loves That's... gambling. I do. <laughs> 
kids don't gamble wait till you're older but uh, don't even no just don't games of chance gamble are fun. in in game not in life <laughs> and then don't find us at gp vegas when we're not playing magic <laughs> because we will not do be what we say not we, what we, we do. do there it is <laughs> okay um so really quickly i did want to talk about that land cycle yeah these are really cool so there are a cycle of lands in battle bonds that are i mean let's be honest they're basically designed for commander right yes they're designed for multiplayer play to be untapped dual lands essentially so they are two color pairs are they the allied pairs or the enemy pairs i think they're allied there's only five of them um we'll show them on that screen they've right revealed now. and they read they come into play tapped unless you have two or more opponents Ooh, which so means in commander they just come into play untapped they are essentially untapped dual lands with no actual cost other than if you don't have two or more opponents so yeah. you'd have to be in a 1v1 essentially because if it's a three-player game you have two or more two opponents, opponents. Yeah. yeah well they're making it so that in legacy they're not creating more dual lands right. but for commander these are good to go now the only thing i'll say is they don't have basic land types on them that's kind of the thing dual lands have like an underground sea is a swamp mm -hmm. uh island and that means you can fetch for it these they can't do that you can't fetch for them but still basically every single one of these is going in every single deck of the, that those colors yeah pretty much there's almost no reason not to unless you're in games where you're like well it goes down to 1v1 so quickly that they might come into play tapped but even then by the time <laughs> it does even if it's a three-player game you know it's turn five six seven and you're not yeah. as worried right? yeah yeah exactly um they're just great lands. It's I think a that's really cool design space. Really cool design. Yeah, yeah, because it requires you to be playing multiplayer, which is what we always talk about as being the thing that we're doing. And I think it's good to make lands, you know, the mana base is just not fun when it's super expensive. Yeah. So I think it just makes four color a lot easier for people to play just to have access to oh, these. Oh, yeah. Another like source that, that can come yeah. to play untapped. Yeah, definitely. I you can't fetch for it, but that's the only big thing. Yeah. I mean, they're not, are they better than shocks or worse? They're close, right? Because the damage does close, matter, but yeah. you can't fetch for it. So. But man, a shock, fetching for a shock costs you three life, which is quite a bit. Yeah, well, especially in 20 life, but yeah, it is quite a bit. So you know what, not too bad, not too bad. I, I'm glad that this exists because it means, oh cool, there's this is the whole design space. We have a bunch of cards that say unless you have two or more opponents and that way it doesn't break legacy or vintage and you can open the world up for commander and multiplayer players. I just hope they finish out the cycle so we have all 10. Do you think they might do that in commander 2018? You know, I could see it happening. Yeah. I could also see that mechanic, if you have two or more opponents, spreading into Commander uh, 2018 yeah. in some way, which would be great. I would love for that to happen. Yeah, it just allows them to sort of, quote unquote, reprint cards that are super expensive because yeah. they're old and they want to get in the hands of casual players. So I'm... You could even do a fetch land that's like fetch a thing only if you have two or more opponents. Yeah, yeah. That card gets yeah. really bad when you get to 1v1, but yeah. hey, that's still a fetch land. <laughs> Or it could uh, come into play tapped unless you have two or players. Oh, yeah. There Same you go. thing. There you right? go. Perfect. You can it still do fetch yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Amazing. There, there's probably a million ways they could make that work with other cards that aren't even lands. Yeah. Uh, just to recreate powerful effects. Okay. We have something very special for those of you that stuck around. We are giving away something incredible. Probably. Here in a second. It's got to be the most valuable thing we've ever given away on yes. the show. Outs I mean, at yeah. this point, once we crack it open, it might not be. Yeah, let's not spoil what it Although is Although it might be yet. really... It might be, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the potential is amazing. So for those of you who have stuck around, um, this uh, summer is going to be a really special summer for the Grand Prix for Wizards of the Coast and for Magic the Gathering. We have Grand Prix in Las Vegas, Singapore, Barcelona, Sao, Sao Paulo, and Chiba. I just want to say I'm going to be at Vegas. Jimmy might be. I might be. I'm still. I, I'm a coin flip. I'm, I'm a literally a coin like flip it. at this I point. Like I get to draw a card. This is great. So the cool thing about these GPs is it's going to be celebrating all of Magic's 25 year history. They're the 25 year like celebrations, and there's going to be some crazy like historic draft opportunities, including at some of them beta and unlimited drafts. Yeah, that is insane. Beta? Beta, beta is like two thousand dollars a pack. That I didn't think betas even existed. Now here, here's the thing: you have to qualify in some way to get into those sort of like those super high end drafts yeah. for the super expensive cards. But they're gonna be doing all kinds of drafts and events with you know older sets and chaos drafts and all kinds of things. Yeah. So in celebration of this magic, um, Wizards of the Coast and Magic, in fact, Trick Jared just handed me these today. They gave us some packs to open. Yeah. And what promotion. we're gonna do, first of all, we're gonna crack packs, which is always fun. Yes. Yeah. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna give away the contents of these packs we're going to give them away one set of stuff to a patron because patrons are awesome and they really keep this whole show going and this whole thing, you know, our head above water. So thank you, patrons. Yes. And the other winner will be picked from one of the people that has purchased the Last Stand playmat. So again, you're going to be, if you're watching the video, you're going to be looking at it right now, Titus Lunter, renowned magic artist. 
did uh, the artwork for the playmat. There's only a little bit of time left to run on over there. If you're on the fence and you're like, ah, maybe I want it, maybe I don't, well, maybe this will push you over the edge. Mm -hmm. Because what we're going to be opening is a pack of Dominaria and a pack of Legends. A pack of Legends. Ooh, boy. I just want to say that these packs unopened are worth about $350 each. Jeez. And then what we had a list here. Let's yeah, let's look let's, up let's the list of the, the list. most expensive cards we could possibly open. Uh, so um, there are a few. The Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale is definitely at the very top. That card is a solid 2.5 to 2800 dollars. Yeah, 2800. I was like going to say million. Million dollars. <laughs> but it's about like Dr. Evil. Somewhere near $2500 value. Yeah. There's um, the Abyss. The Abyss is about what is that? 1800? Yeah. Nether Void. About 1000. Chains of Mephistopheles. I still don't know how that card works, but it's about $800. There's a moat that could be opened. That's 600 ish So a bunch of reserveless cards, basically. Yeah. And really good cards in Commander, actually. Tabernacle's good. Abyss is good. Nether Void's good. Chains of Mephistopheles will confound your opponents and make them concede. Invoke Prejudice is just mean. That is mean. Angus McKenzie, oh, $250 yeah. or Silver so. Silver Library's on here, too. The Mana Drain, Silver. the original man. It's an uncommon, too. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's an uncommon. We could get two of those. Oh I'm assuming gosh. we're going to get two oh original gosh. managers. Okay, so here's the thing. Again, if you want to be a person that wins one of these, we'll be giving them randomly away. One of these sets to a patron and one of these sets to someone that pledges for the last stand playmat. Now, again, if you're already pledged or a patron, you're already entered. But again, the playmat, I think, is going to be over extremely, extremely soon. So get on it if you're going to pledge for that playmat. Otherwise, you're just literally not going to be able to buy the playmat again. We'll basically give away this. the contents of one Dominaria pack and one Legends pack to one and one to the other. Right. Randomly selected. Let's open the Dominaria first. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> it's the least exciting, but still, Foil Karn or Foil Mox Amber are mm -hmm, still worth mm -hmm. quite a bit. Mm, new card smell. New card stock, too, actually. Smells nice. Okay. What did you get? I got... I should just go back, straight back to the right. I see Manipulator. I got a Jaya... I'm just kidding. Ballard. Ooh. That's pretty good. Is that an epic? That, oh, epic. Mythic? Yeah, that's an epic. <laughs> it's a Planeswalker. Do I even play this game anymore? Jaya Ballard. Uh, there's a Garn of the Blood Flame in there. Nice. I got Zahid, Jinn of the Lamp. So that's the uh, four blue blue flyer that costs way less if you tap. So if your you three pack is already better than mine from a draft perspective because I want the Zahid. Dude, Zahid is amazing. I don't know if I take Jaya in a draft. Two red red red, 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 red. Yeah, that's throwing you deep into a color. It also doesn't like protect itself in any way it creates mana and draws cards i think it just dies right away i like the other one better honestly what to other no the other um uh legendary in there the black red one right yeah garna Garna's, Garna's really good sweet, i yeah. might draft garna yeah either way someone's going to be winning one of these but more importantly all right nobody cares about that let's get on to the legends pack of legends i'm gonna let you open yours first okay Whew, i'm nervous i know me too you're, <laughs> okay you're holding potentially I, up to you know the first pack of magic cards i ever opened was Legends. Really? Ooh, yeah. I remember going to the store and seeing it cost like $5 and being like, that's too much. Give me Ice Age. I <laughs> what was it? I think I've told the story on the show before where I actually considered buying a Black Lotus because it was like $11. Oh my gosh. And I uh, <laughs> instead bought four packs of Legends because I think they were like 250 Because I was like, well, I could get one card or I could get 60 cards. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I rue the day. And I do remember the very first rare I opened from that very first pack was Dak on Blackblade. Dak on Blackblade, really? Yeah. Amazing. Well, um, let's see what your second rare or fifth rare is, I guess, at this point. I opened more than five, four packs. I'm assuming it's Tabernacle, Pendle Veil. Vale. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh my, my gosh. Goodness. I am so excited. I feel guilty opening it. Do they okay. even, wait, what is that card? Oh, yeah, they used to have a rules card. So this is the rules card. Hmm. New Magic the Gathering rules specific to Legends card. <laughs> it explains banding here. Oh, just what, okay. That's yeah, good. That's good. Rampage is explained. It tells you what multicolored cards are, Enchant Worlds, oh and gosh. then Legends and Legendary Lands, because this was the first set that had Legends. That's right. That's right. Um, although this is out of date, because it's going to have the old Legend rule, I think. Okay. What'd you um, get? I got a Goblin Taskmaster, a Shield. Oh, my gosh. And the, you don't see Legends cards that are in this good a shape. No, ever. Goblin Taskmaster? I got a Pavel Maliki, which is a, a, a legendary creature, so you could build a commander deck. That's a deck. dollar. Um, I'm just going. I'm not going to name that them all. Looked like that looked like a volcanic island, even though it, it definitely wasn't, isn't. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting near to where the uncommon. Look at the Oh, my gosh, that giant guy. Giant Strength. Giant Strength. I love that art. Where's my rare? Which one is it? Is it Force Spike? There's no way it is. I forget the order that they put they it in. They put in Pyrotechnics? Clergy of the Holy Nimbus. You don't even know what your rare is? Giant Slug. I don't know because there's not... Well, it's not Tabernacle Pendrel Veil. Sorry. It or, might be Pavel. Oh, so my rare is Angelic Voices. It's two white-white 
for an enchantment as long as the only <laughs> creatures you control are white or artifact creatures all your creatures gain plus one plus one all right now it's let's... still actually worth quite a decent amount just because you know it's people... an anthem effect well and it's a rare from a super old set yeah so people who are trying to like create a full set of legends they wouldn't maybe need this card now here's so. a question josh do you can you try and guess what the oracle text is on that card now because that text is kind of janky yeah. what do you think it says it's supposed to say um I have no idea. If you, if, I don't know. Read it. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one, as long as you control no non artifact, non white creatures. All right. All right. Okay, Jimmy, save us. Get a tabernacle. Tabernacle. Change the well, that's police. a $25 card, so it's not actually there's. And I got the Jaya. The Jaya, that's right. So somebody's getting decent value here. Yeah. Oh, my Most goodness. Most important part first. I'll include the rules card with the, with the winner. Amazing. Does it still? I got Urborg. The, the original, original Urborg. A legendary Not land. as good as the... Life Chisel. Oh, I remember Lesser Werewolf. Typh I think it might be Typhoon. Did you get a Mana Drain? I did not get a Mana Drain. I got, for my rare, Typhoon, which is a sorcery, two and a green. Typhoon does one damage to each opponent for each island he or she controls. That's actually kind of brutal in Commander. It yeah. Might do like, it would do like six to everybody. Yeah. Um, you all know, the smart people. This card is also a hot 20 bucks. So amazing. I don't think there's a rare in the set that's worth less than 20 because if you're trying to fill out a yeah. set, you can't. You know, that, you is still that is still value. That's so still I will value. include the rules card with this. So again, if you want to win one of these awesome packs or these set of packs, go ahead and become a patron. Or if you're a patron, you already entered. Or go and get the last stand play mat off of Kickstarter before you can never, ever, 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 ever buy it again. And we'll include the original uh, booster pack as well, just because this is this is an. Oh, we will. Okay, good. I, I mean, gotta fold mine up nicely. I not the not. Dominary one, just the Legends one. There you go. All right, <laughs> let's move on to the episode. Oh my gosh. Holy moly. Yeah, that's done. There's a lot to talk okay, about today. Okay. All right, so we are going to be talking about the Shadowborn Apostle Athreos deck that uh, I played in the most recent episode of Game Nights. Now, this is a little bit unique. We haven't done this very often. It's actually revisiting a deck. We talked about this way back in episode 48. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a lot of people watch Game Nights are going to be curious about the deck that didn't, you know, watch that old episode. Also, there's been some changes because that was like three years ago now. And people love have talked about this deck quite a bit, actually. Yeah, I'd say it's one of our more popular ones. If you go to Tapped Out and looked at, you know, the amount of views our our various decks have gotten over mm -hmm. the years, this one is is up there. So it's a popular one, and it's a really fun deck to play, and it's super unique. Um, it's just there's not a lot of decks in the format that are doing what this deck is doing. There's a Relentless Rats deck, and that's kind of the only other equivalent. Yeah. Um. So we're gonna look at the deck and some of the new cards that maybe came out since last time and just kind of break it down. So let's read the most important card in the deck. We're just throwing paper like crazy. So you might think that it's the commander, but it is not. It is a card called the Shadowborn Apostle. <laughs> so Shadowborn Apostle is one black for a 1-1 human cleric. And it has very important text that says a deck can have any number of Shadowborn Apostle. Oh, sorry. Any number of cards named Shadowborn Apostle. So this can break the Highlander rule in commander. It, you know, we say the rule is besides basic lands, you can only have one copy of any card in your deck. That's just sort of a commander rule. Shadow War Apostle, because of the rules text on the card, can break that rule. So you can have as many of these in the deck as you want. Um, then it also has the text, you can pay a black and sacrifice six creatures named Shadowborn Apostle, then search your library for a demon card, and then put it onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. So it tutors for a demon and puts it into play. It just doesn't tutor it into your hand. Now you need six Shadowborn Apostles to activate that ability and you have to sacrifice them. And the sacrificing of them is why I chose um, Athreos as the commander. You can do this with a few other, uh, I think Shire is, mm -hmm. a, is a very popular one. There's a few others. I wanted the white in the deck, so that's why I chose Athreos. And, and I guess let's read Athreos here. Yeah. So Athreos is one, a white and a black. This is a legendary enchantment creature god, the original from the Theros cycle. Uh, it's indestructible, 5-4. As long as your devotion to white and black is less than 7, Athreos isn't a creature. And the, mo the most important text, whenever another creature you own dies, return it to your hand unless target opponent pays 3 life. So anytime one of your creatures dies, you target an opponent and you say, 
listen, do you want to pay three life so that it goes to the grave, stays in the graveyard? Or do you want to not pay three life, in which case it goes back to my hand? Yep. So every creature that dies, you have a chance for it to go directly back to your hand instead of the graveyard. Very, very powerful. A little, it requires some politicking and, you know, playing in a specific way to sort of maximize it. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a way that at certain points in the game, you sacrifice six Shadowborn Apostles to get a demon to play, and then you're really putting somebody to the, do you want to take 18 damage? Yeah. I mean, or 15, they, 12, 9, 6, 3, what are you willing to take? Exactly. You can give them three back and take nine damage, or give them four back and take six, mm -hmm. vice versa. So super interesting. Um, yeah, so that's It kind adds up. I'll yeah. say that much. Having played against this deck a few times, at first it's like, of course I'm paying the three life. But as the game goes on and the deck keeps powering on, again, you have an indestructible commander and you have so many redundant copies of the Shadowborn Apostle that this becomes a problem quickly for certain players. Yeah, and I will say that as the years have gone by, I've cut Shadowborn Apostles, but I still run about 28 of them in the deck. So I think that may be low. And that's one of the things I would warn people about when building this deck is I think you want around 30 Shadowborn Apostles. Mm -hmm. I think originally when I built it, I think I had close to 35 and that was a little too many. And now I think I've gone a little bit too low and I think the sweet spot is right around 30. So, um, okay. Well, let's talk about sort of the big thing that you're going to do with the Shadowborn Apostles, at least at first, and that's go find demons. And because you are tutoring and putting them in play, you can put some really powerful demons in there because you're not planning on casting them. So yeah. the first category is demons. And some of these demons, honestly, you play in decks just to hard cast them because yeah. they're so good. And this one definitely is one of them. It's Runescar Demon, five black black for a six, six flying creature demon. When Runescar Demon enters the battlefield, search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So it's a seven mana flying six, six demonic tutor. And this is almost always the first demon that I go get. Uh, because it guarantees tutors a card for you, and there's a bunch of cards that aren't demons right. that you really want to make the deck go. And so nine times out of 10, 99% of the time, even more than nine times out of 10, Runescar Demon is the card you go get. Um, another demon that could be your first demon that you go get, depending on your board state, mm -hmm. is Razaketh the Foul-Blooded. And this is a card that came out since the last time we did an episode on this deck. So it, just because it didn't exist back when we did the episode before. So it's five black, 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 eight mana total for an eight, eight legendary creature demon. It has flying and trample, but it says pay two life and sacrifice another creature and then search your library for a card and put that card into your hand Whoa. Then shuffle your library. So you demonic tutor at the cost of two life and sacrificing a creature. Now it costs no mana. You don't have to tap Razaketh. All you have to have is a creature that you want to sacrifice. You can do it at instant speed. It's pretty good. So if you had seven Shadowborn Apostles, you could maybe think about going to get Razaketh first and then sacrificing the seventh one to go right. tutor. But again, even in that case, that's still a Runescar Demon. You really need eight, you need two extra creatures to sacrifice to make Razaketh better than Runescar. Right. So that's usually the second demon I get out once the board state is already, once I got some other stuff going on. But it once you have Razaketh out and you can play a couple things, you feel so safe. Because think yeah. about it. If you get Rezekith and like four Shadowborn Apostles out and Athreos say, you're not even really scared of a board wipe. Because if they do, you sacrifice all the Shadowborn Apostles in response, go get your four best cards, and then Rezekith dies. And then you might get that stuff back because of Athreos. Yeah, which is kind of scary because at a certain point, and especially towards the late game, there is going to be a player usually that you can be like, no matter what, they have to give me back my cards because their life total is so low that they can't risk it otherwise. And the way the deck works is you're going to be able to churn and replay your stuff anyway. Sometimes they pay the life and you actually want them to because oh gosh, yeah. then you just get the stuff back out and do it again. And it, this deck is very good at getting to the point where like they just don't have a choice. They can't do it. Uh, one note we should say with Athreos is that in Magic, a player cannot pay life that they do not have. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it says you need to pay life on it means that anybody who's at two or one they have to give you the cards back. They can't, yeah, they can't just suicide themselves. Yeah, now if they're at three, they can. They can go to zero. Can they concede at sorcery speed? Yeah. <laughs> you can concede, I suppose. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the next demon up is one of the better cards in the deck just because it will further... I mean, it's it's similar to Razaketh a little bit. It's yeah. Harvester of Souls. It's a six-mana demon, 5-5 five, five with death touch, and whenever another non-token creature dies, you may draw a card. So great in general because it affects the entire board but also if you're sicking sacking six shadowborn apostles at a time drawing a bunch of cards potentially draining someone of life very effective yeah i mean 
now your Shadowborn Apostles, you sack six, draw six cards, then put a demon into play. Mm -hmm. Pretty insane. Uh, the last demon is kind of a win condition, an alternate win condition sometimes in the deck. It's Obnixilis Unshackled. It's four black black for a four four demon, has flying trample. It says whenever an opponent searches his or her library, that player sacrifices a creature and loses 10 life. That part's Oof. not the alternate win condition part, but because Shadowborn Apostles can be activated at instant speed, mm -hmm. You can sometimes get somebody. So you've got six Shadowborn Apostles out. They go to fetch land with that ability on the stack. You sack the Shadowborn Apostles, put Obnixilis into play, and now they got to sack a creature, lose 10 life. Yeah. And uh, and Obby's out, so he gets the next part of his text, which says, whenever another creature dies, put a 1-1 one -one counter on Obnixilis. So their sacked creature, he'll probably be a 5-5 five -five at that point. And then consider that you're going to sack Shadowborn Apostles constantly, <laughs> and this guy is going to get huge. And I've actually, you know, had him be like a 40 40 that's this just, just one shot. Smacking people. people. And he's got yeah. flying and trample. So, yeah, the trample is very relevant uh, because of how big he gets. Yeah. And sometimes you can do those type of shenanigans on the end step mm -hmm. where, like, they don't see it coming. He's like a 5 5. And then you do a bunch of stuff on an end step where all of a sudden he grows to, like, you know, a 40 40. And then boom. Are there many other demons in the deck, Josh, or is this it? So. I think this is one of the things I learned when building the deck. And a lot of people, when they build their version, they put too many demons in. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to get really enamored of having a bunch of demons. But I only have like six or seven. Because honestly, once you get a couple of them out and the train's sort of rolling, the demons are not that useful anymore. Yeah, they don't, they're not the ones that necessarily win you the game, which is crazy to think about. But Yeah, you're not like swinging for six in the air to win. <laughs> That's just not how it works. You're using the demons to sort of get you to the pieces of your deck that do make you win. Um, and that's why Obnixilis is kind of a alternate win condition. It, it, Athreos is really a win condition, if anything. Yeah, it, Athreos can be too, because Athreos gets indestructible. This is not one of those decks. So a lot of the Theros gods, you don't want to ever have them have devotion because you don't want them to be um, vulnerable, vulnerable to, to, to removal because you don't want them to turn into creatures. But Athreos actually in this deck is often devoted and you're often just like, whatever, I crash in there for five indestructible. And it's... Turns out that's actually hard to deal with. It costs three mana, too. It's yeah. a really cheap commander, and any commander that costs three or less is and, and can be used well is very powerful in the format. You can swing with it on turn four, too, right? Turn yeah. one, Shadowborn Apostle. Turn two, two Shadowborn Apostles. Turn three, Athreos. Now you only got to play a couple more Shadowborn Apostles on turn four, and you're swinging. Um, swinging for the fences. Swinging for the fences. Okay, so those are the demons. Let's talk about now the best cards in the deck. Oh, God. So, yeah, I used to think the best card in the deck was not this card, but the more I've played it, that is the card that it's I almost always go get with Runescar Demon. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, let's walk on the edge with Edgewalker. One, a white and a black for a handsome creature, Cleric 2-2. Two, two. You can't actually see his face, so I have no idea. Cleric spells you play cost white, black, less to play. This effect reduces only the amount of colored mana you pay. Now, that is a very rare, weird thing. Usually, it's like... Usually, the other way. <laughs> usually, yeah. Usually, it's the colorless or the, the generic mana. But in this case, it actually reduces Cleric spells by white and black. But... We only care about one of those pips, and that's the black pip. And that means you're playing every Shadowborn Apostle for free. Yeah. Edgewalker makes Shadowborn Apostles cost zero mana, which is, you know, most cards now would say this cannot reduce it below one mana yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But no, that doesn't have that text. So Edgewalker, as soon as you play it, every Shadowborn Apostle is free to play. Now, imagine the scenario where you have Razaketh, Athreos, and Edgewalker. If somebody's at a low enough life total that they can't afford to take the damage. You're mm -hmm. sacking to Razaketh. Athreos is triggering because the creature's going to the graveyard and then it's going back to your hand. Well, you're playing it for free. So that's just like unlimited tutors right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. It gets insane once Ed Walker's out. It opens up all the doors to all the crazy shenanigans. So Making something cost zero usually does in Magic. Yeah. So this card, uh, Skull Clamp, was what I used to think was the best card in the deck, and it's still the second best card, I think. So it's one mana for an equipment. Target cre creature gets plus one, negative one, and whenever equipped creature dies, sorry, not target creature, equipped creature gets plus mm -hmm. one, negative one. Whenever equipped creature dies, draw two cards, and it costs one to equip. So with Shadowborn Apostles, you just equip it, it dies, you draw two, so it's a one mana draw two. Maybe Athreos triggers. Athreos almost certainly triggers, and then, you know, probably get it back to your hand, so you're not even losing the card, so it's kind of like one mana draw three i guess yeah it's crazy it's so good that i actually run enlightened tutor and steel shapers gift in the deck just to find it steel shapers gift only finds an equipment it's a tutor for an equipment there's one equipment in the deck 
it's worth it to run Steel Shaper's gift because the card is that good. Yeah, drawing drawing lots of cards with Skull Clamp, obviously very good. Oh, here's um, a new one. Yeah, this one's really interesting. It's three black black. Never thought I would see this in Commander. It's called Secret Salvage. It's a sorcery from Kaladesh. Exile target non-land card from your graveyard. Search your library for any number of cards with the same name as that card. Reveal them, then put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. You could draw like 15 to 20 cards with this. Easily. Easily. For There's 28 mana. Shadow War Apostles in the deck. There, yeah. should be, there should be 30. Yeah. There's a lot of games I've played where I, I'm i like, will somebody just not pay the life? Or sorry, will somebody pay the three life so one will go to my graveyard That's so I can so funny. cast Secret Salvage? Yeah. This is the kind of thing that pun is that sort of uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh-huh. So like a Shadowborn Apostle dies, if they give it back to my hand, that's value right now. If they let it go to the graveyard, well, now I have Secret Salvage available to me. Mm-hmm. So that's a really powerful card. Um, a card that's similar in two aspects uh, is Thrumming Stone. It's five mana. It says, spells you control have Ripple 4. Here's what Ripple means. Whenever you play a spell, you may reveal the top four cards of your library because it's Ripple 4. Mm-hmm. You may play any revealed cards with the same name as the spell without paying their mana costs. Put the rest on the bottom of your order uh, of your library. So if I play a Shadowborn Apostle, just one, Ripple. I look at the top four cards in my library. Any Shadowborn Apostles in there, I can cast for free. And it goes again. And then those will Ripple for I've often cast Thrumming Stone, then cast one Shadowborn Apostle and gotten all 30 Shadowborn Apostles into play. Because if you ever hit two, now you're rippling four twice. Yeah. And then that's just over. Yeah, so it's like 100 divided by 30, let's say. So you have a one-third chance of doing it in and general. And you're looking at four cards. Four cards, yeah. And then if you did, if you hit two, then you're looking at eight cards. There's just no way that you're not going to... I mean, like you'd have to get pretty unlucky to stop the chain. It, it happens. Like Sometimes you only get to 12 or 15 or something. Yeah. But I, I have very often been like, cast one Shadowborn Apostle, get the rest out of my you deck. You still get quite a bit, obviously. Yeah. And you do cast those cards off Throwing Stone, which will matter in a minute here. Yeah. Uh, Phyrexian Altar, very obviously the only kind of sack outlet you want to run in this deck because for three mana, you can sacrifice a creature to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Shadowborn Apostles cost a black, so you can sack it for a black and then start essentially cycling through them as a result and playing the next one for free. Um, yeah, it's kind of like Edgewalker almost in that you sack it for the mana to cast it. And again, with Athreos out, you're putting someone in that position mm-hmm. where, like, are they going to pay the life? And if they don't or can't, then you can just turn through the same Shadowborn Apostle, just casting it and, and recasting and, it. Yeah, and, and there are, of yeah. course, a lot of cards that just sort of will pay you off for doing things like that, even mm-hmm. though casting and recasting that card doesn't do anything. Well, if you have Dictate of Erebos or Grave Pact out, Oof. which are the next two cards on the list, then all of a sudden you are really punishing your opponent. So Dictate of Erebos and Grave Pact are basically the same. One costs three black, black, and has flash. That's Dictate of Erebos. Grave Pact costs one black, 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 and does not have flash. And they say, whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature. Ugh. So, again, in that scenario we just mentioned, I have a Shadowborn Apostle and a Phyrexian Altar out. I sack it to make the black. I say, Jimmy, do you want to pay three life or put it back in my hand? Go back to your hand. Goes back to my hand, and boom, because it I sacked it and it died, Dictate of Erebos triggers, everybody has to sack a creature. Now I replay it, sack it, boom, replay it. That's a way to one-sided board wipe. Or just sack six, get out of the Harvester of Souls, and laugh as every time they do this, <laughs> now you're drawing cards too? Yeah, that's it's pretty, so good. pretty silly. Yeah, that's so good. This is like the this kind of deck is really interesting because it, it shows the power of being able to have multiple copies of one card in your deck. Yeah, because um, there's a lot of... Uh, cards that sort of will take advantage of that that we can't normally play, yeah. like Thurming Stone or whatever. Yeah, this is just like a weird, very slim like engine, essentially, to think about it. Um, a lot of Commander decks are a little bit more convoluted than this. Now, I know what you're thinking, and you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? People will just pay the three life, and then your engine will never get rolling, because mm-hmm. three life isn't that much. Here's the thing. You have a lot of ways to... like A lot of times, especially early in the game, I don't care if they pay the life or not, because my deck is has quite a few ways to just get all of the stuff out of the graveyard all the shadowborn apostles because like you said it's one card so there's this card which is again another card you'd never play in any other any other commander deck remembrance i love the art three and a white for an enchantment whenever a non-token creature you control is put into a graveyard you may search your library for a copy of that creature card if you do reveal that card put it into your hand and shuffle your library afterwards so this is a white card that you wouldn't be able to play if if you weren't running athreos or a white black commander so anytime a shadowborn apostle dies 
you get to go search your uh, library for a Shadowborn Apostle, put it into your hand. So now, Yowza. once you get Remembrance out, nobody's paying life because they're like, what's the what's the difference, right? Yeah. Six die. Is it better for you to have 12 in your hand or six? It doesn't matter. If I pay 18 life, you still have, will have six in your hand. Yeah. So that's a card that, and even if they don't pay the life, you're going to have 12 in your hand. Now, if you have Edgewalker out, you just pay play 12 Shadowborn Apostles. It's pretty insane. Um, Another card that will get all your Shadowborn Apostles back is Angel of Glory's Rise. Oh. It's five white, white for a four, six flyer, but it says when it enters the battlefield, exile all zombies, just as gravy, and then return all human creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Shadowborn Apostles are humans. Human clerics. So seven mana, get all your Shadowborn Apostles back from the graveyard. You're not going to want to play it before you have seven mana anyway. Or yeah. sack seven Shadowborn Apostles to Phyrexian, to Phyrexian Altar. Altar. And then somebody play. says, oh yeah, I'm just going to pay the 21 life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Fine with me. Uh, and, oh, hey, you're a zombie deck too? How convenient. Uh, <laughs> finally, we have Immortal Servitude, which is X and then three hybrid mana of Orzhov. So X, white, white, white. It's X, white, black, black. White, black, white, whatever. Black, black, black. Black, black, black. Uh, it's a sorcery. Return each creature card with converted mana cost X. From your graveyard to the battlefield so four mana bring them all back yep that's that's powerful it's so good that's absurd yeah it's it's really good it's perfect Again, for this deck. people think they got you they're like okay we paid the life we got them in the graveyard we and board then wiped just, and we yeah. all paid the life and you're the life gain deck so fortunately yeah nope nope boom just bring them all back few ways to get them back, i've played yeah. immortal servitude and gotten 20 cards onto the, onto okay. the battlefield yeah. let's not get, brag <laughs> about it <laughs> okay so that's sort of the engine right it's getting the right cards which your demons help you do and then getting an engine built where the table just can't keep the shadowborn apostles from mm -hmm. sort of dying and coming back dying and coming back and now how do you take advantage of that and that's going to lead us to the win cons so there are two that are sort of the most common ones i use and it's blood artist and zulaport cutthroat now zulaport cutthroat another new card since um uh we did the last episode on this deck you could also do, what is it, Falconrath Aristocrat? Falconrath? Falconrath Noble? Yeah, no, not Noble. But there is another one that drains, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's more expensive, so that's why I like Zulaport Cutthroat. They both basically do the same thing. Uh, I'll just read Blood, Blood Artist. It's one in a black for an 01 vampire. But it says, whenever Blood Artist or another creature dies, target player loses one life and you gain one life. Drain them. So, again, once you're in that loop with Phyrexian Altar or something, you can just drain somebody out. You just play it, sack it. Target them. Do you Target them. Do you want to play the life <laughs> so or not? Drain four, yeah. gain one, yeah. If they do or don't, doesn't matter. Do the next one until they're at a life total that's two or less. And then you target the next player because now that player has to give you back your Shadow Warner Apostles. Right. Drain the other players fully out and then finish out the drain on the last player. Um, yeah, this is a very common way to win. Zooport, I think, does all opponents. So it, it yeah. Which even... is actually a little bit worse. Oh. Um, because oh, I see it will yeah. destroy the player that you sort of have the most control over. Yeah. So yeah, if yeah. somebody's at two life, you don't actually, you want them right there. So, and that would be something I would say if you're playing against the deck and somebody's low on life, you actually want to knock out the person, the opponent that's low on life because they're enabling the Shadowborn Apostle yeah. deck. Um, here's another win condition. And I want to say, when we did our last episode about this deck, I actually listed this under the trap cards. Mm -hmm. I actually thought this wasn't good, and I've come around on it as an alternate win condition that also helps this sort of sacrifice creatures a lot plan. So Yeah, it's two in a black for a 2-2 two -two human wizard. Whenever Zathra, Necromancer, or another human creature you control dies, put a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. I can see why it feels like a trap card. They're tapped. Um, this is also a, a, like literally not good with Angel of Glory's Rise. Uh, but here's the thing. You just have more fodder for sacking, more fodder for doing stuff with to, to Razaketh, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's actually because originally when I said it was a trap card and I didn't think it was good, my mindset was I'm going to be attacking with the zombies. Mm -hmm. But that's not actually what ends up happening. You actually end up using them for sacrifice fodder. And this really gets you out of some situations where like, you know, maybe things haven't gone well and people are at high enough life totals yeah. that they can pay the three life at a point when you don't want them to. Right. Well, now all of a sudden, Zathra Necromancer says, every time I sacrifice a Shadow Mourn Apostle, I also create a two, two zombie, which gives me something else to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that can become, you know, basically 
I'm sacking all my creatures twice. Yeah, you kind of get, if it's to the altar, then you get to have extra mana as yeah. a result. Yeah, it's pretty good. Or to Razakath or to, you know, other sac effects in, in the deck. And and then there are definitely points in the game where, like, you just wait, and on the end step before your turn, you're like, sack everything. Do you want to pay the life? No, bring it back to my hand. Now create, you know, 24 zombies, untap with 24 tutus, and that will win me the game because yeah. I can't attack with them. Yeah. So uh, the last one, oh, I didn't pull it. It's Tendrils of Agony. Tendrils of Agony. Oh gosh, two black, black. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I'm okay. spotting you. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Hold on. Let me see if I got it from memory. Two black, black for a sorcery. Um, each opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. But it has storm. So for each spell you've cast, or each spell that's been cast this turn, you make a copy of that spell. Yep. Am I right? You're right. So this was not in my original build of the deck back three years ago when we did the. Um, the episode but it's become a pretty good win con because it's funny how often in this deck you just happen to play 20 spells in a turn right because especially if you got edgewalker yeah so you play edgewalker you then you play like 12 shadowborn apostles this happens all the time even that right there if you just played tendrils of agony right after you did that you're going to drain everybody for what 30 or tw 13 26 Right, that'll yeah. end a lot of games, you know. It, that are it'll also put you super far ahead life wise, yeah. and if you have a Razakath out too, like oh my gosh. But very often you're just casting. Let's say you have Thrumming Stone out. Yeah, Thrumming Stone casts the cards. Oh, that's so what, I yeah. play one Shadowborn Apostle. Sometimes I just get twenty more off of it. I've cast twenty one spells that turn. Tendrils will win in that case. So I have found Tendrils to be just pretty good in the deck as sort of and nobody sees it coming too yeah it's like storm yeah it's the kind of win con out that they're just deck. not ready for yeah they think oh you have put blood artist. a lot of times i put blood artists out knowing it's going to be a lightning rod and i'm just like deal with that deal with that and as soon as you do boom i'm going to tendrils yeah because now you've sort of wasted your not to mention it's storm so you can't even counter you can't counter the first one 50 copies of yeah. it whatever or not 50 you have to have very um specific counter spells that counter like all spells on the stack or yeah whatever. like uh, the one that ends the turn yes. yeah yeah that sort of stuff so um yeah tendrils is a really good card in the deck and and one that took me a while to find i probably played the deck for a couple of years before <laughs> i was like well you, you know what? i should try this um so well there's two things i wanted to talk about here i guess we can start with how to play against the deck and it's Jimmy, you fun. You've played against it, and you played with it a couple times. Yeah, it's true. Um, fun to play. Yeah, I remember. not fun to play. Against. I think I have this picture of you with literally every thirty-two shadow. Yeah, I definitely out. won that game too. <laughs> yeah, you I was did. just like I was in just in just pure bliss. <laughs> so yeah, how do you combat this deck? I think one of the ways is mass creature removal, but early. Early, yeah. You have to do it before the life total uh, gets weird and low. Because at that yeah, at a certain point, something has to be like, I'm gonna take it for the, I'm gonna take this one for the team guys. I'm gonna take 15 life to board wipe right now. But it's gonna set them back far enough yeah. that you know this is gonna be, they're gonna be, you know, not like they can't recover, but by the time they do, somebody else will be in a position to win maybe. But you also need to like hold up a counter because you might have a bring them all back card, right? Yep. So you, you have to like doubly make sure because just a one two punch of like, all right, they took a ton of life, but they brought them all back the next turn is can be really back breaking. And the board wipe plan doesn't work later, like you said, because if somebody's at you know less than twenty, mm -hmm. they're they're not going to be able to pay pay the life, and and so it won't do what you want it to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, mass exile is really good, depending again. Uh, so like merciless eviction or something that says exile all creatures or t mass tuck, put all creatures, shuffle them back into the library. This is a way to sort of get around the graveyard Athreos thing, so they can't just put them back to their hand. Now, yeah. that's why there are a bunch of sacrifice outlets in the deck, and so if they have one of those out, then mass exile won't work. Just sack uh, them all. In fact, in game nights, you see that I'm because I'm able to sack things to Razaketh. I'm. It's really almost impossible for the table to chaos warp or sorts of plowshares and get rid of things like Edgewalker or Blood Artist for good. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they go to my graveyard because I sacrificed them allows me to have them available later to play them back out. And that's one of the really powerful things. And and you don't really want to play some of your cards until you have a way to sort of protect them with the sack outlet. Yeah. Um, life gain is a big thing in 1v1 because you're always just going to find someone else to go against and but, to take you know to target true 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 and somebody can get to the point where blood they blood arse you out or whatever right but a life gain is a way to sort of like be able to pay the life um but you're right it unless everybody can life gain it's not that big of a deal yeah or unless you sort of mess up or something goes wrong where like all of a sudden your head's up in a situation where you don't have somebody at low life total that you can hold hostage yeah, yeah. i think also forcing the player to never have six 
Yeah. You know, so if you're just constantly attacking them and forcing them to block or putting them in the position where they're like, well, I need to have six next turn. So do I chump block or what do I do here? And then paying the life so he doesn't get it back. So you can just never let the sixth hit the table. Yeah. Um, because once they do, there's they're tutoring twice. Tutor for the runes card, tutor for the best card. Yeah. And from that point on, you're in really big trouble. Because if you didn't pay the life or whatever, they probably got a card that brings them all back. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really hard at that point. Um, and the last one is graveyard hate. So you can, with certain graveyard hate, you can, once they hit the bin, get rid of them for good at that Scavenging point. Scavenging ooze them. Yeah. Find a Death way right to... Death Shaman them, maybe. Yeah. Find a way to Bajuka Bog them. Um, yeah, it gets rid of the creatures. Yeah. Um... Just, yeah, but Juke Box tougher because they already came back from Athros. Right. If there's any sitting there, though, it's still worth it because they don't let them Secret Salvage. Yeah. Don't let them Angel of Glory's Rise, that kind of stuff. So, Graveyard 8, always good. Take um, away the different, this has like, this is like a four or five weapon beast. So, take away its weapons, you know. So, there's an interesting question when playing against the deck and how to combat it, too, because, on, you know, we always talk about like how to build your deck to beat the, mm -hmm. the deck, but there's also how to play against this deck. How do you, when you're playing against it, Jimmy, sort of tackle oh the question of like, do I pay the life or not to give them the cards back? I don't know, because it, the question changes from the person playing it throughout the game. Like, it's not as important in the beginning, but it can be very important later on. So you almost want to like save your life totals for when it does matter. At the same time, by giving them the cards back, they just are able to keep building and building and building. So you're watching the building rise while your life total falls. And at a certain point, you have to like cut it off. So it's it's weird. I think I think the way you really do it is just see how much it's worth it to the player and then whether or not you can take the life loss. But in general, I like putting them in the bin if I can. Yeah, and I would say as you know, the one playing the deck most of the time, what I w almost always want them to do is put it back to my hand. Yeah. Not that it's like game ending or I can never win if they put it into the bin. Because it still advances your, the way you do win eventually. Yeah, but it, it's going to slow me down. Yeah. And so I would say that paying the life whenever possible is the right way to go. But towards the end of the game, when it really, really, really matters, you still have to make sure you have enough life to do it. Um, but at a certain point, you also can't let them build up enough. So it's it's a very delicate balance, I think. And, uh, and it's, it's one tough. thing that's important when you're piloting the deck, too, to keep in mind that dynamic. Because yeah. this is a deck where you really want to concentrate firepower on one person because you really want to get one player to the point where you've got them. They, have, they cannot pay the life. And that's your go-to, you know... When I really need the card back to my hand, I target them because they can't afford to do mm -hmm. it. And so I know the outcome too. You don't really like to be in the position where it's like, I don't know what they're gonna do. <laughs> I like to be in the position where like, I know what I'm gonna get. So yeah. when I take an action, I know I'm getting it back to my hand and I can plan for that. Not, I take an action, boy, I really hope they give it back or boy, I really hope they put it in the graveyard. Like you wanna sort of have more control over it, so. Yep. Um, because, th because this is an episode where we're sort of talking about a deck that has changed over the years based on you know, playing it more, and also because new sets have come out and new cards have come out, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, upgrading your decks when new sets come out. How do you know when to include a new card? How do you know which card to take out? Mm -hmm. How do you tackle that question? Um, if you, I think you always have to keep it like this is the reason I make graphs for all my decks or separate them into categories and tapped out because when you start taking cards out, you can actively hurt your deck more than the card you put in. So for sure. very few cards can like be so good that they overpower a great card you take out. Like Panharmonicon, for instance, is one of those cards where it's like if your deck can like really use this effectively, it is so much better than anything else you could put in there. For instance, like if it's a skull clamp you're putting in this deck, then you can definitely take a card out for that. So you always have to just weigh that against what you're doing. Because I've had so many decks just fall apart over the years because I've taken too many cards out, put too many other special th fancy new things in. I'm like, oh, I want my deck to do this now. And you get sort of like attracted by the shiny light and then your deck starts sucking. Yeah, it's a really tough thing. And I think there's a point at which... Or you do the stupid thing where you take a land out. And you're like, yeah. oh. <laughs> that, that's what happens after like a couple of years. My deck has just like three less lands yeah, than it should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think what I like to do, too, is sort of test out a card. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to play the deck enough at that point to know. There's two cards I'm sort of testing right now. And I think actually one made the deck worse and one made it better. So oh, okay. um, here, I'll let you read the one that made it better. And that's ah. what, is that Conspiracy 2? It's a, yeah, it's a tutor. Conspiracy 2. Recruiter of the Guard, 2 and a white for a 1-1 one, one human soldier. 1 Recruiter of the Guard enters the battlefield. You may search your library for a creature card with toughness 2 or less. Reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Well, boy, oh boy, Edgewalker. Edgewalker is so the best same card in reason, the deck. Yeah, same reason that you get uh, things to look up Skull Clamp, you have another card to look up Edgewalker. And also it does find uh, Blood Artist and Zulaport Cutthroat. Oh, that's a great so point. So it finds your win conditions even in the point where you're not... Um, yeah. You don't... You know, maybe Edgewalker's already out or you have Phyrexian Altar or something else. Mm -hmm. So that card 
you know, that's like Panamonicon, right? No brainer include. Uh, definitely makes the deck better. Here's one I tested out, and I think it's probably not as good as I thought. Although, you know, this is a type of card that in certain builds hmm. or, or this is harder to tell if this it's This is hard not, to tell. Right? Okay, so this is Bantu's Monument. It's a three-mana artifact, legendary artifact from Amonkhet. It says black creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. Doesn't really matter too much because it doesn't reduce the amount of color, right? Mm -hmm. So it won't make Shadowborn Apostles cost any less. It, it can matter for Blood Artist, Edgewalker, etc., but that's not why you're playing it. You're playing it because the second line says, whenever you cast a creature spell, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Hello. So that's interesting. It's not as good, I think, as like Zulaport Cutthroat. Ah, I don't know. Blood Artist is definitely not as good. Blood Artist is so good because you target it. Yeah. This one hits everybody and can sometimes mess you up, like I said. Right. And I've definitely had games where I didn't want to play the Bantu's Monument. This is kind of like Tendrils of Agony, yeah. but less effective. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It's interesting. It, it definitely, it's redundant effect, right? You already have three different things that do this in the deck now. So you're just wondering whether or not the mana reduction plus this ability is worth it for a three mana card. And the way that it tends to roll out is like you play it and then you're hoping that like everything goes according to plan right now, right? So I'm about right. to play six more Shadow Worn Apostles. Will they remove that? Will they take the damage when they die or not? Will mm -hmm. they, you know what I mean? It Tendrils is so good because they don't see it coming until it's already over. And it's very hard to stop. Right. This is, I don't know. I've found that there's many times where I, I don't want to play it because mm -hmm. it'll kill the player that I've got in, I've like, worked so hard to get into the position where they have to give me my cards back. <laughs> yeah. Or I don't want to play it because it's going to paint a huge target on my back and I can't win with it yet. It's just going to be slow damage over time. Right. Whereas Blood Artist is like, play it, win. Yeah, you want something that will be effective enough to win the game without having to... You, you are jumping through hoops for Bantu's Monument. But it is a card that seems like it would be really good, right? Yeah, it definitely does. But then again, like your best case scenario is getting to the Edgewalker play a bunch of them, right? Yeah. So who knows? This does help, though, because when you're playing them and reducing someone else's life, then they're easier to target. But you're right. At a certain point, you don't want them to get so low that they die. And you can't control this. you can't this. control that, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So those are the things that I th I think we think about. And, and you know, if I'm being honest, and probably a lot of people are like this, I'm not necessarily really good at going back and taking out cards I've put in that right. I've decided are not as good, you know? And I need to be better at, like, this is on a trial period, and now the trial period's ended, and I've decided it's not good enough. Time it didn't for make the audit. Time. See if yeah. I need it. Yeah. I'd never do that last part. I'm like, I'm at such a trial period. I'm going to put it in there. <laughs> Two years later, it's still in there. It's still in there. Yeah. Uh, and I still feel the exact same way whenever I draw it. Yeah. But, you know, it's a pet card now. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. To the listeners, we want to know what you guys think of Battle Bond. All right. So that was our preview card for the day with the partner with mechanic. Uh, very interesting. We want to know whether or not you think it's cool, whether or not you are excited to see what other cards are in the set. I definitely am because of those those lands that we saw. Those if there's sweet. more things in that realm of stuff, then let's go. Yeah, and at this point, when you're watching it, a lot more cards will be known. Again, we only know the lands and our two cards. So yeah. I think this partners with is an interesting way to sort of tackle the partner mechanic. It'll be interesting. I guess it's all predicated on how good those partner pairs are. Mm -hmm. And look out for the other people previewing the cards. I believe they are also some iconic partners in the Magic world. Let us know who your favorite real-life partners are. And you your second point favorites, yourself, too. partners. You have to point at two people. Um, <laughs> yeah. And your second favorite partners as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all the Battle Bond previews. I think it's going to shape up to be something really cool. I'm really excited to play it. So Yeah, me too. That'll be fun. We'll be playing at GP Vegas. Well, hopefully you will be. I yeah. will be. <laughs> I'm hoping Jimmy's there. Because, you know, that's the other part of my partner half. What am I going to do? True. All right. Make sure, if you want to buy any of these cool cards we just talked about, like Shadowborn Apostles, that you go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Oh, yeah, I didn't throw it. Well, I was going to show us our sweet playmats. Oh, yeah. If you use that affiliate link, cardkingdom.com slash command zone, when you order your magic products, your singles, anything, you really are supporting this show. You're supporting Game Nights and all of our content. We really do appreciate it. And, of course, the other sponsor for the show, Ultra Pro. They make all of the awesome magic product that you use to make your magic product safer and cleaner and more fun to play with and easier to shuffle. Eclipse sleeves, everything around the world, playmats, including our playmat, the last stand playmat, only a few hours left to buy it right now. In fact, if you're someone that watches these videos later on, well, I'm sorry, you may have actually missed the playmat all this time we spent talking about it. 
our bad. So make sure you guys check out that link in the more info box below. If you want to buy that playmat, again, it's never, ever, 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 ever going to be sold after this Kickstarter ends. We still get questions about the first one and whether or not people can buy it. So don't miss out. And remember, uh, one of the purchasers of the last damn playmat is going to get a Jaya Ballard, Angelic Voices, or maybe a, what was a, your rare? Uh, he, nope, not Zahid? Healing Grace. Uh, it was uh, a Z Zahid Jinn of the Lamp and a... Typhoon. Typhoon. That's and what it typhoon. was. A typhoon, yeah. Okay. So, lots of value in these packs. There might be some other legend cards that were worth something. There definitely we are. We just didn't even look at them, Yeah, honestly, we didn't so. look at each one. So, all right. Now, now it's, it's time for the end step. End step. Where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Wow. Totally practiced that. It was awesome. <laughs> that was sweet. Um, I have one. Yeah. So it's a new podcast. It's very much like the other podcasts that Stop I have taking recommended. taking people away from our podcast. I'm just kidding. No, because if you like podcasts like our podcast, then you probably would like other podcasts. Good and point. So I've talked about Serial. I mm -hmm. talked about Up and Vanished. Uh, this is in that mold. So it's sort of this true crime it's become a fad for like journalists to like go and try and solve like an old crime. It's cool. I really like it. It's pretty sweet. Also, it, like let's solve those crimes. Why yeah. are they not unsolved? Yeah. A lot of them is Innocence Project. So the Innocence Project is you know, a uh, uh, organization that's going around and looking at old cases and people who maybe were wrongfully convicted or whatever. And right. this is one of those stories. Um, so they're doing an investigation of a like a quadruple murder. Whoa. You know, I forget where. And super interesting. I like this stuff. If you liked Up and Vanish Serial, that kind of stuff, it's really going into the details of the case and why the person that they convicted for this crime may or may not be uh, actually guilty. So yeah. fascinating. You can you can unlock your inner Sherlock. <laughs> I don't know what I like about that, but it is fun to just be it like, cool. you're trying to put the pieces together in your head and you're like, Dude, oh, that doesn't make sense because of blah, blah, blah. Or maybe it was this person. And It's the same reason that we have like fan theories on, what, on shows and yeah. all that stuff too. Yeah. Making a Murderer was another one I think yeah. we talked about at one point. I just, I guess, I just true crime stuff. I just have a. Josh likes blood and guts. Apparently, I don't like the crime, but it, something <laughs> about solving it or the intricacies of how. I do love Sherlock Holmes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's called In the In the Dark. In dark. the Dark. Yeah, there's been two seasons. The first season is done, and they've started the second one. Did so. they solve the crime for the first season? The first season was. Oh, interesting. I guess we shouldn't spoil it, huh? Yeah. Well, the first season was interesting. The crime actually was solves quote unquote they arrested somebody and saw and 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 convicted somebody like right around the time that the podcast was coming out it was oh, like i don't know why that timing happened but anyway it was still interesting okay you know what else is interesting <laughs> or cool and that you're not in the dark about it is the masters of modern podcast that was like three segues in one no i've wasted all of them wow you won't see a segue from me in a while <laughs> alex kessler and ben bateman they host the masters of modern uh, you can find them on Twitter at the MMCast right next to us at collected.company. They talk about the modern format, all things competitive magic. I believe they'll be at GP Vegas also. Yes, and actually Alex is uh, previewing and testing out his new board game that he made really recently, which is really cool. So if you guys are interested in Kesco, which is Alex's board game gaming company, make sure you go on over. I'm sure they'll be talking about it on the MMCast as well. Yeah, so the his game is called Battle Bosses. Battle Bosses? Yeah, Battle Boss. Battle Boss. Yeah. Uh, not to be Might confused be with Battle Bond. Um, I know they were like... Battle Bond, crap, crap. Because you worked all this time, and then the name got mixed up. But yeah. it's different than Battle Bond, but it's called Battle Boss and uh, or Battle Bosses, and um, yeah, it's cool. It's a cool game. If you guys, I haven't had a chance to play it, but it looks sweet. I played it. Yeah, it. it you know, Alex is a Magic player, and a lot of the Big games time. that he has has elements of what I really like about Magic in it. So it's cool. It's like a board game. You're moving around a little boss thing. All right, our editor for the show is Terry Robertson slash Craig Blanchett. Craig takes on the episodes, Terry takes on game nights. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the living card animations that adorn our wonderful backdrops. Oh, this one is Balam Nahara. Oh, this is Balam, sorry. Yeah, but, but Jeffrey does do like the Soul Ring intro animation. And, yeah, and, and the outro as well. Yeah. So you can find Jeffrey at Living Cards MTG. And thank you all so much. Make sure you go to youtube.com slash the Command Zone podcast to watch the video versions. Uh, you definitely want to see us crack open some Legends packs, right? Man, I wish we got a tabernacle. I know. Can maybe we, next time. Maybe we can get him to give us a couple more so we can try again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trick, you, you still listening at the end of this podcast? I'm assuming he's been listening this whole time. Yeah, Trick, you there? More free product, please. To give away. To give away. We're not keeping it. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com.
or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>